Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Alex Titus. Welcome to the first episode of the Oregon Bridge podcast. End of the day, it's making sure that we're putting pressure on people and that we are also empowering folks who are directly impacted by these policies to raise their voices. I do know that there are people in the Republican Party who recognize that things like housing are critical and that's a space that I know that we can cross party lines. There's space to work with one another when we're willing to listen to each other. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on this first episode of the podcast. Our guest today is State Representative Winsvay Campos. Uh, Representative Campos represents Aloha in the state legislature, and she's got a really compelling background and story about how she got there. She's the youngest woman ever elected to the Oregon State Legislature at 25 years old. Um, But before that, she was raised in Bandon on the southern Oregon coast um, in a low-income household with a single dad. And she graduated from Pacific University with a degree in political science and then went to work as a case manager um, for Family Promise of Beaverton, which is um, about connecting um, low income folks with housing resources. Uh, She ran an incredibly progressive campaign. She was the only candidate, legislative candidate in Oregon, I believe, who was endorsed by um, US Senator Bernie Sanders. And it's because she was talking about the Green New Deal. She was talking about Medicare for all. Um, she was talking about an increase in education funding, some of the backbone progressive policies that are exciting the left wing of the Democratic Party. So, uh, Alex, I'm curious, what was your impression of Representative Campos? Yeah, she was honestly really, really impressive. Uh, and I mean, I think the most interesting thing about Representative Campos was that she's young. She's bringing bold ideas. I mean, she wants to start a progressive caucus to basically have them all vote together. I think that was something that uh, hasn't even come out in Salem yet. So, I mean, we'll have to see how that sort of plays out to develop too. But I mean, I think a lot of the complaints from the Democratic side of the aisle in Oregon is that, I mean, Oregon is, uh, you know, basically controlled by, by the Democrats, but you're not really seeing these big, bold, progressive ideas that are coming out of Salem that are really shaping the national conversation. And I think that what Rep Campos brings to the table is she is thinking about these big ideas, right? She's going big when it comes to progressives. She wants Medicare for all, housing basically as a human right. She's leading the charge on the racial justice issues, which have, you know, basically blown up in, in Portland and uh, swept across the country too. So yeah, I think it's, it's, and obviously her age too, right? I mean, I think that's a really interesting factor than this is that uh, she's young and she's ready to sort of embrace change and put forward these these big ideas. Uh, and I think that that's just a, a sort of change that you're seeing amongst the Democratic Party is sort of the old guard uh, start, starts to starts to retire and some of these new young guns start coming in. So, yeah, I think that that's she's, she's very interesting. And I mean, I hope that as folks listen, they sort of take note of the different issues that she chooses to focus on, too. Right. Because these will be the big issues that her and her allies in Salem are really starting to push. And Ben, I know it was your idea to, to bring her to bring her on the podcast. So I'm curious, what was sort of your your recap of her? What do you think the big things are that she said? What should the viewers really be listening to? I think definitely be listening to the the segment where she's talking about, as you alluded to, the founding of a progressive caucus. Obviously, there's currently a moderate caucus in the in the Democratic caucus, um, which is sort of the like center left um, uh, state representatives who kind of try to work together as a block when possible. Representative Campos told us it was the first time I had heard this that um, some of the the left wing. Um, progressives of the House Democrats are creating their own caucus, but not only that, not just for for legislative negotiation, they're also talking about creating their own PAC, um, political action committee to actually fund candidates that they believe um, align with their values as progressives. That's a that's a change from what we've historically seen in Oregon, where um, Future PAC, the official campaign arm, kind of like the DCCC for the at the federal level, has been the sort of one stop shopping for um, caucus. Uh, contributions. Uh, that seems like that's going to change under uh, Representative Campos and her her colleagues, and particularly the freshman class of of representatives. For me, I think um, I think if you want to understand the future of Oregon politics, you have to understand Representative Campos's story, because, and we say this in the podcast, ten years ago, I don't think Winsvay is able to get uh, elected in the way that she did because she won decisively in a suburban district. This isn't Southeast Portland. This is um, Washington County. Um, and she won decisively running on those big ticket progressive items that we talked about. Um, so yes, I think, I think she's potentially a harbinger of things to come for the Democratic Party in Oregon. And I hope, I hope our listeners are able to learn something from the podcast.
Yeah, and and Ben, I thought what was really interesting too was, uh, and I didn't even mean it as a gotcha, but clearly she was a little bit surprised by the question in terms of uh, what the issues she could see herself working with a Republican across the aisle and who that person was. And uh, as we alluded to in the podcast, I mean, you've seen some really weird coalitions in Washington that have come together, like Rep. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, partnering with Trump ally Matt Gates, uh, you've seen Bernie Sanders partner with Senator Josh Hawley, uh, which are two basically polar opposites in terms of most issues, but can come together on a couple of things. And I mean, she seemed open at least to working with Republicans on a number of issues. So I thought that was interesting too, because you know you have some of these sort of rising stars who basically they say, no, all these guys across the aisle are bad. We refuse to work with them. There's basically nothing of value that they're bringing. But uh, at least so far, I don't think she has that mindset, uh, which which is good. I mean, hopefully it causes more uh, productive dialogue and actually we can get some things done in Salem. But I think it will be interesting to see, uh, you know, how she starts to play out in, in this next session that if she actually does work with some folks across the aisle uh, and if they can actually do something together. So, yeah, I think that she's a really interesting, you know, case study in this. And I mean, also, I just want to point out to the viewers that, you know, she got an endorsement from Bernie Sanders. Uh which I've worked in national politics, obviously not on the progressive side of the aisle, but like it is not easy to get these sort of endorsements when you're running, especially when you're 25 years old and you're running for state legislature. So folks should be paying attention to her. You should definitely be listening to everything that she says because uh, she may be just a state representative now, but I think that she has a lot uh, to go ahead of her, especially at the eight, young age of 25. So I think we'll see a lot of exciting things uh, if you're on the left for, for Rep Campos to come. Yeah. And, and listen to the story of how she found out about the, the Bernie Sanders endor endorsement. I thought that was fascinating to hear kind of under the hood how it actually worked um, in her case. So that's a, the preview of the episode and some of the things to be looking for. Thanks again for tuning in. And uh, don't forget to give us a five star rating uh, wherever you download the podcast and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. All right. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the episode. Okay, great. Uh, welcome to the Oregon Bridge uh, Rep Campus. We're very excited to have you on the pod today. And thanks again so much for, for taking the time to join us. So I just want to start off, you're 25. You grew up in a single parent household. You're the daughter of immigrants. And now, if I'm not mistaken, the youngest female legislature in Oregon history. Uh, if that doesn't sound like the American dream, I don't know what is. I just want to ask, how, how are you feeling right now? Uh, I, today, today I'm feeling very tired, <laughs> but overall, you know, it's been, it was, so I was sworn in this past Monday. Is that right? A week ago. Wow. And it hit me over the weekend, really, that it's a thing that happened. It was Saturday night and I was talking to a friend and I was talking about last week and it occurred to me that the week was still happening. <laughs> um, but so much went on, we, and so much has been going on since election day, uh, transitioning into the role, but it's been a whole nother thing, lots of meeting requests, realizing that nowadays I have to find 10 minutes in the middle of the day where I can be a human being in between all of these meetings, but it's been really exciting. I've learned a lot in just, in just this last week. That's awesome. Um, and I have to give full disclosure here before we go too much further. I was a big supporter of Representative Campos in the campaign. And uh, so don't want viewers or listeners to think that I'm a neutral party here. Um, but I want to talk about your election a little bit because I have a theory and I'm interested to hear if you agree, but you ran an incredibly strong campaign and you won over endorsements and supporters from like long-standing institutions, the labor unions, environmental groups, pro-choice groups, other elected officials, et cetera. And I don't think that that would have happened 10 years ago. And I certainly don't think it would have happened 20 years ago. You know, you're someone in your mid twenties, you're a woman of color, you're very progressive, further left than most of the caucus that's been reported by several media outlets. You're not running in Southeast Portland. You're running in a Washington County suburban district. And you were running against this woman who was sort of like inoffensive, moderate, you know, the traditional safe choice to replace a um, what was a moderate, long, long-term moderate Democrat in the state legislature. And yet you won handily. You won with, I think it was like 54, 55% of the vote in a three-person primary where this, um, this sort of middle-aged white woman got like 20 points less than you or 30 points less than you. And then there's another candidate. So I'm curious, A, do you agree that with my view that your election is sort of like a sign of change and a sign of things to come? And if so, what caused the shift and why do you think you were able to be so successful in the campaign? Because I know initially you weren't sure. You weren't sure if it was going to come together, but it did. So curious your thoughts on that. 
Well, you are absolutely right. And I've told this a lot to people, particularly throughout the campaign trail, that when I was starting to gear up the campaign and I was having conversations with community leaders, I kept waiting for somebody to laugh me out of a room. Because you, here you had, when I started to campaign, I was 23 years old, hadn't held public office. And as you're noting, you know, was much more progressive than others that are currently in the caucus. I come from a low income background. So it was really difficult to fundraise from the offset. And so, you know, but nobody laughed me out of a room. People were excited about it. And I, th- and I think really what resonated with people was the story that I bring and the perspective, the, the idea of the perspective, perspectives that I bring into that building. And I focused a lot on, you know, the, the things that are really meaningful to everyday working Oregonians, knowing what it's like to go to the food bank growing up, knowing what it is to struggle paycheck to paycheck. And so I think, you know, people heard those things and they, and and it it was really interesting as I was having these meetings to watch that moment run across a person's face of like, oh, wow, like this is somebody who's ready to bring real change, who knows what it's like to struggle, who knows what is going on on the ground and who isn't just, you know, somebody who's retired. And so I think that's what really made for an impactful, inspiring campaign. And I firmly believe that it is a sign of change of the, that this is what we are moving towards mm. because I did have a, a formidable opponent, somebody who was able to bring in her own money, who for all intents and purposes, was a nice woman who has lived in in the area for many years, who raised her children here, who raised her family here. But I think we're in a time right now where people are looking for somebody who's inspiring to them, who really makes them feel as if change is coming. And that is what we pushed in my campaign, whether it was me talking about my background and lived experiences or the work that I do in my day-to-day job, or the messaging that we did in the campaign of, you know, I am ready to advocate for, for the many, not just the few. Well said. Titus. Yeah. And, and uh, Rev Campos, I think one thing that was particularly interesting about your candidacy, besides that you were just able to do it uh, at, at such a young age is the level of support you were able to get from, you know, not only the local level, but also the national level. Uh, you were endorsed by Senator Bernie Sanders, who, of course, uh, came up short twice in the Democratic primary, but remains one of absolutely the most influential Democrats across the country. So I want to ask you, uh, how did you even get to that point where, you know, you have someone like Senator Bernie Sanders either calling you on the phone or having his team reach out to you or you reach out to them to get a level to get an endorsement like that? And, you know, it's particularly interesting that you at the local level were able to get something like that, right? You're not running for Congress. You're not running for governor. Senator Sanders is obviously very busy and you're a local up and coming politician and we're able to get an endorsement like that. Can you just walk us through, did you, did you talk to the Senator? Did you meet with his team? We'd just be really curious of how you're able to do that. So I woke up the morning, I believe that the article came out and had a number of text messages on my phone. <laughs> Um, from people congratulating me and uh, sharing the link of the article with me. And I was just shocked. I yeah. didn't know that it was going to come that day. I did not know it was coming at all. Wow. It was a total wow. and complete surprise to me. And it completely, I completely threw my morning for a loop. And suddenly I'm like, oh, okay, I've got to like share this out, you know, do the whole campaign thing. So I didn't even get a chance to process it because it was immediately in like turn that into action kind of mode. And it was later on in the afternoon when I finally, because I was supposed to be working that day. And so I ended up working pretty late into the night to make up for the morning being thrown off. And so it was when I finally got to the office that I was sitting at my desk and I was like, wow, I just received an endorsement from U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders. And Uh, It was an overwhelming feeling and really exciting, but I hadn't reached out to them. What it sounds like happened was there were a group of local Oregon folks that were chatting with the team and and had put some candidates on, on his radar, and I happened to be one of them. And I think it goes to speaking to the relationships that you build, uh, the the community that you build, 
And so uh, I've been involved in the political sphere for about, well, since 2013, 2014, through a volunteer capacity. I've worked a couple of jobs in, in the political sector. Um, I've also been involved with my county party for the majority of, of those years since 2013. So I've built a lot of relationships and friendships. And so that was one of the things that helped when I started to campaign was that there were people already that know that I stand behind my values and my beliefs. And it was some of those people that were in that group that were putting candidates on, on Senator Sanders is, uh, in front of him and uh, it was it was just relationship building at that point and that it was inspiring, I suppose. What's so funny to me is like, there definitely were hundreds of candidates across the country who were desperate to get a Bernie endorsement and like working so hard and like networking like crazy to try to get into the Senator's orbit. And it's funny to me that it just sort of showed up on your lap, um, but it speaks, I suppose, to, to your appeal. And it transitions to what I want to ask you about, which is I have a theory about you, how, how you fit into Oregon's political landscape. And the thesis of the, the Oregon Bridge podcast is essentially that the nationalization of our politics is having a huge impact on the state of Oregon and that it's allowing people and events and policies in Oregon to earn a national stage. So I know on Twitter, you're very active in like liking and supporting and promoting the squad at the national level. So AOC, Mayanna Presley, um, Ilhan Omar, like these congresswomen who are young, new to the new to the elected sphere, but very influential and using their platforms to sort of advance their proposals in a very public way, right? So they'll call out Speaker Pelosi or they'll call out Senate President Chuck Schumer. I think it's interesting because I see parallels between how you are approaching your role as a state representative and how they approach their role as Congress people. And so like there's a, you quote, you quote tweeted Ted Wheeler and basically did a little bit of a smackdown on evictions and said, well, maybe we shouldn't be having evictions during a global pandemic. Uh, you publicly called for the governor to call a special session to address a lot of what was happening with COVID-19. So I'm curious, when you think about the squad and AOC and their leadership on the national stage, do you think that that's the space you're trying to occupy on the Oregon political level? And do you plan on kind of using their approach, which is not being afraid to call out leadership, not being afraid to call out party leaders if they believe they're wrong, and how you see yourself fitting into that construct? Yeah, so so I, first of all, do enjoy being active on Twitter, <laughs> but I think, you know, that certainly we, there are a number of us in the, in, in the freshman class that a lot of folks have noted are, are more progressive than, than the caucus as it currently is. Mm -hmm. And we have had conversations with leadership where we have noted that we as a group would like to push us more, more left. That, that the time is now. Um, and we are, to a certain extent, trying to capitalize what is going on at the federal level. Before you go on, I'm interested. So those conversations with leadership, are they like inviting a group of you on a Zoom call? Or is it you picking up the phone and saying, hey, I want to talk about this? Or what does it look like to exert influence within the caucus? So we haven't really had like Zoom calls where that's been going on. I guess it happened at some point on the campaign trail where we had our individual conversations, our individual phone calls with them and said, you know, like this is this is where I stand. And yes, you know, I am ready to bring forth more progressive legislation and have had conversations with leadership where they're like, yes, we are ready to see the caucus be more progressive and we're excited to see this incoming class. And we as a freshman class have been meeting as a group ourselves and have talked about how we can best support one another. One of the things that we have talked about is putting together a progressive caucus within the legislature. Right now we do have a moderate caucus, but we don't have a progressive one. So it's an idea that we've thrown around uh, so that we can perhaps work together as a block to push forth a number of things that a few of us freshmen are wanting to push for. Has anyone pushed back on the creation of a progressive caucus? Haven't received pushback yet um and it's i would say still in its infancy so that that there's a, a follow-up question i have to this that's sort of it's about race and identity and politics and you know some of our our listeners might know about um, representative bynum's attempt to win the speakership and i don't really necessarily want to talk about that specific example but i thought it was interesting because there was this coalition of moderate democrats who supported um, Speaker Bynum. 
and very progressive members of color or white um, representatives who felt like representation and identity was really important. And that was like this coalition. It wasn't a majority of the caucus, obviously, um, as Speaker Kotek is still Speaker Kotek. But it gets to an issue that I think I'm curious to hear your thoughts on. So we want younger elected officials, but we also wanted, and I'm saying we as in like people who might occupy a space of believing identity is important in the political context. So we want younger people in politics, but we support Bernie Sanders for president and we supported Ed Markey over Joe Kennedy. We want women in politics, but we support Joe Biden rather than Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar. Black people in high positions of power, East Asian people in positions of power and women in positions of power, but Kamala Harris isn't progressive enough for us. And so we're unhappy um, that she was selected. So you're someone who's spoken about wanting younger people, wanting a, and I agree with you, we should have a representative body should look like and sound like the people they're representing, but we all don't want Sarah Palin to, to be the vice president of the United States, right? So how do you think about weighing identity versus weighing whether or not someone agrees with what you believe in when you're making decisions about who to support for public office or for leadership positions? So here's the thing, and I will tell you that I've gotten in trouble for this once or twice in my years of politics. I firmly believe that representation isn't the end all be all. Representation is really important. And when we look at the policies and the way in which they impact people directly, we see why, right? We know why representation is important. But progressive policy is critical, right? So if we've got, you know, a young woman of color who isn't on board with, you know, some of the things that we'd like to see, like a higher minimum wage, um, healthcare for all, addressing climate change, that's not, and we've got somebody on the other spectrum who, you know, is perhaps what you might look at as your more standard politician, white, cisgendered male, but that they are the one that's going to be willing to push for these progressive policies, then that's who we're going to get behind. Because again, it's not, representation is not the end all be all. We would like to see more representation in these positions, but these progressive policies are the things that directly impact these communities, low income communities, communities of color. And if we don't have somebody who's going to push for this, then where's the win? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm also really curious, Rep Campos, of where you think age comes into that. In terms of these folks who you're trying to form this progressive caucus with, I imagine are they all under the age of 35 or any of them might be the same age that, that, our, that our parents might be? I'm really interested, especially as Ben was sort of framing this earlier as the squad, right? All of them are relatively young too. I don't think they're all under the age of, of 40, but I think that most of them are at least in, in their 30s. And I know that Representative uh, Ocasio-Cortez is, is in her late 20s. So I'm curious, what sort of factor do you think age plays into that, right? Like, are there older progressives who you think, oh, you know, they're in their 60s, but they really get it. They're right with us on the issues. Or do you really only think that, okay, you know, that was just a different generation of politics in general. We really need some fresh blood. We need some fresh life. We need some younger people. They're the folks that really get it. I'm really curious to your perspective, how you think age plays into this. So I would say that progressive policies and, and the movement that we've seen in the last few years goes beyond age. I know numerous older folks that maybe don't represent the diversity that we're talking about, but who, you know, at times are in conversations I've had are even more left than I am. They're even more progressive than myself. And so there are people in our corner that, you know, they just, they get it. But I think what it comes down to is that we've got a lot of young people because we know that we need more young voices in this space, it's specifically the issue of, of climate change, that younger generations see they have that urgency to address this issue because they're not talking about their grandchildren. They're talking about their own their own lifetime, not, not even just their kids, but the things that they're seeing and experiencing right now. But what, what it comes down to is that we need to make sure that we are making these spaces more accessible to young people so that we have that representation. And not just to young people, but for low income folks, for communities of color, because there are people who have these progressive values and agendas, but can't get into these positions because we don't pay legislators for the amount of work that they en end up putting in. The, the role of money in politics is still so great that, you know, for somebody 
like myself who comes from a low income household, it was a concern that I wasn't going to be able to raise the money I needed to run a campaign. And then, you know, we've got people who still have to maintain a job outside of it, whose job might not be flexible. And But I'm going off on a tangent. But the point being is that these policies aren't just limited to young people, but we need to be making these spaces accessible to younger generations. Really well said. And I'm glad that you mentioned, I mean, for, for listeners who don't know this, the legislative salary is not a salary. It's abysmal. It, I think it's like less than $30,000 a year plus a per diem. So I know you're, you're working a full-time job. Yeah, while- I think it's 21,000 plus the per diems. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's incredibly low. It's ridiculous and it's not accessible, but I want to talk about accessibility from another angle before we transition to a a broader topic here. So one thing AOC has done and her colleagues in the squad is be very willing to support primary challenges to Democrats who are sort of in the way um, or are not willing to embrace rapid progressive change. And obviously you endorsed me and my Senate campaign, my Senate primary challenge to the Senate majority leader, but that was before you were elected. And now you're a state representative who will be in a caucus with some of these potential members. And I'm curious, do you see yourself as someone who would be willing to support a primary challenge if there's a conservative Democrat or a moderate Democrat who's holding up progressive legislation? Or do you do you see it as, you know, some people will make the case, you know, you have to be friends with your colleagues and you have to support your colleagues and you're all on the same team together. How do you view that dynamic? You know, there's that piece, and, and I mentioned it already, of relationships, right? And in politics, we know that those matter. And so, yes, you want to be able to maintain friendships and relationships. But I think one of the most important things in a friendship is being able to be honest with somebody, being able to be straightforward with them. And if that means that, you know, I end up with a friend in the legislature who is more conservative than we would like to see and see an up and coming progressive challenger who has ideas, who has the passion, who has the values, you know, it's time. We can't just be okay with being okay. We can't just be okay with settling. And I think for far too long in a lot of these positions, that's what we've accepted. It's not an easy thing, Ben, as you know, to to challenge an incumbent. Uh, But if we've got somebody who's willing, who's brave enough to do that, uh, you know, I say go for it. That's awesome. Um, I appreciate you you saying that. And I I love your directness too, because that's something I think you would ask that question to a lot of freshman legislators and they would answer by not answering it. But I just appreciate your directness. Well, and and Ben, I think it's interesting to me that, and I won't go too far on this tangent, we can move on to the next topic, but Of course, on the national and the local level, uh, in the Republican Party, conservatives have done an excellent job over the past 10 years of primarying people that they deem as AKA rhinos or Republicans in name only or moderates. And I mean, you have serious conservative and center-right institutions that are basically almost fully dedicated to primarying members that they don't agree with. And to me, it's just so interesting because you have groups like Justice Democrats, you have prominent figures like Bernie Sanders, who, of course, you know, comes out with endorsements with progressive candidates on the state level sometimes, too. But it just doesn't feel like, at least with progressives, that there's that much infrastructure to do something like that. Whereas with Republicans and conservatives, it seems like there's a lot of infrastructure to support those primary challenges to people that they don't think are being held accountable. They're not voting the way that their districts want them to vote. I just find it interesting that, you know, there doesn't really seem to be an avenue like that for progressives. The thing that I would say as a progressive Democrat is we actually don't want to be the Republican model because the Republican model of primarying people has actually led to many general election losses, including several Senate seats that have cost the Republicans dearly. So to me, it's like, like when I ran for the Senate primary, it was in a deep blue district where there was 0% chance a Republican was going to win that race. So there's no excuse not to represent your constituents. The question will be for the Oregon legislature, like towering figures like Senator Betsy Johnson, who is a long-term Democrat, who most folks would identify as conservative, but represents a rural area where it's not clear I don't know, like, I guess that would be one question that I would have for the representative is like, you know, in, 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 we don't need to talk about Betsy Johnson as an individual, but there's a lot of districts like that, that are represented, you know, we just lost a coastal seat, we lost a couple coastal seats in the Oregon legislature where Democrats held the seats. And then in the most recent election, Republicans won them. So I'm like, the question is, you know, it makes sure it's, it's easy to primary people in Portland who are moderate, or even in Salem who are moderate, perhaps. But when you get into the areas of the map that allow Democrats to have damn close to supermajorities, you know, 
you have to make a calculation, a strategic calculation there about when you primary, when you don't, because you're you, you, there have to be people in the caucus who aren't as progressive as Representative Compost, as I'm sure you would agree. And the question is like, where, how do you make those calls? So I don't know if you've given that any thought. I've given it a lot of thought. It's a conversation that we're having, that we've been having amongst many of us of the structures that we currently have in place. I think it's even more a conversation that is being had because we had those losses of like, why are we having these losses? Where, we, where can we make these gains? Where, where are the spaces that we can look beyond, beyond just the numbers and feasibility? There's the piece of being strategic. Then there's the piece of knowing I don't know. You know, it's it's a difficult thing to answer right now because we're still analyzing what just happened in in these la in this last election cycle, totally. where you know there are theories that where people were more bold was where we picked up seats, and then there's the like, well, you know, how much effect did did Trump have on on districts like like the rural areas that where we saw losses, and so. I don't really have a super concrete answer. I will say it's something I'm thinking a lot about and a lot of us are considering is how do we get beyond and and doesn't mean that we have a whole separate entity for those listening who aren't, you know, don't know so much of the structures here. We have Future Pack, which their intent is essentially to protect our our supermajority, um, is to invest in those races, um, but not so much in picking up seats. They've done it before, but it's not necessarily like their main goal. Hmm. And so perhaps it's looking at a different entity that we can be empowering so that they, they are able to do that at the same time. Yeah. So Future Pack for, for listeners is the official campaign arm of the House Democrats. So I, I'm not sure if it's re technically run by rep you know Majority Leader Smith Warner or Speaker Kotek, but it's run by the leadership. So what you're talking about is some equivalent, a state level equivalent of like Justice Democrats, where a separate group of elected officials create their own pack to invest in the races that they want to invest in. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm nodding and forgetting that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So zooming out a little bit, talking about, I want to talk about national politics, national politics, but I want to use Portland as an example. So I know you attended the Portland protests, the BLM protests. In fact, we went together one time. And uh, just on a, on a sort of broader level, like why did you show up to those protests? And like, what was the experience on the ground when you were actually there? So I attended the protests because this is something Black Lives Matter is what it is. It's an important movement, but beyond just, you know, saying Black Lives Matter, we need to make sure that we are taking action in, in moving this forward, right? In supporting the Black community in, if we have the capacity to do so and getting out there and, and being there in, in camaraderie and in support in whatever way we can be. Um, again, it's, it's not just saying the words Black Lives Matter, but doing something about it and willing to show up and willing to be somebody who, you know, because I, I, even as, you know, a young woman of color, uh, the daughter of immigrants, there are still a lot of privileges that I hold whether that is, you know, needing to run if, if the things that happened happened of, of tear gas or, you know, police officers and, and the violence. And, um, and there's, you know, like I, I am documented. So if I were picked up, like that's, that's not a fear that I have. And so knowing that I have those privileges, just being at home and, and not doing anything about it just didn't, do, doesn't sit well with me. So what, so when you were there on the ground, what, I mean, describe it, was it like what you were seeing in, on the news or was it a different experience or was it a mix? Well, you know, it was a lot of what I was seeing. And I will say that uh, I was following a lot of it, a lot of what was going on downtown on Twitter. And so I think that's, that's a space where you can see more of like reality instead mm -hmm. of just like what the way in which the news sometimes portrays things, which can be very, like, you're not seeing the full picture. It was, I mean, I remember standing hands in the air with other people, like surrounded by people whose hands were also in the air and like no one was violent. I think there was a beach ball being thrown around and we were tear gassed. And I didn't stay, um, I'm thinking of one time in particular, didn't stay super late. Cause that's when it was. I, I work. Right, like when um, it would be a turning point in the night where like after a certain point it got like crazier, violent, um, tear gas, et cetera. But before that it was like 
you know, peaceful speeches, drumming, like that kind of thing. So you didn't stay late. I didn't stay super late because I had to be up and be a case manager the next day. But I, you know, there were lots of talks of, of protesters getting violent and it was just not something that I saw. Um, it was not, there was really no cause for, for the excessive amounts of tear gas that were happening. So I want to ask Alex this question because so Alex, uh, you know, worked in the Trump administration and worked for a Trump super PAC, like comes from the right side of thing, the right wing side of things, certainly not the right side of things. Um, um, <laughs> but I want, but I very, very good pun there, Ben. Very, very good. <laughs> Thank you. But so what Representative Campos just described is not at all the way that the national right wing portrayed what happened in Portland and sort of profited off of what happened in Portland. So how, how do you describe, or how do the people in your circles describe the Portland BLM protests? And like, how did that play out? Yeah, so one interesting story from this, at least for me, and this was in 2018, uh, this wasn't in 2020, but yeah, I worked for the America First Action Super PAC then, and we were basically one of the biggest spenders across the board uh, in the 2018 election. And there was also protests and riots and things like that happening uh, in Portland. That was sort of when... And Tifa kind of blew up on the national scale and became an actual thing. And one of the, the things that we would basically do is, and there was even this guy, I don't remember what his name is, but I follow him on Twitter and his, his job, like his full-time job is just to sell B-roll footage of like crazy things that are happening in Portland. What's B-roll uh, that is for listeners? B-roll is basically like someone, cause you know, everyone can, you know, use their phones now for video and for things like this. And he basically, his job was to just go around Portland all day and just record what was going on. That this basically was this guy's job. That was all he did. Or like There's a couple of people who, or, exactly, yeah, people like that. But yeah, basically people get this B-roll footage, which is just video footage. And we were able to really successfully use this actually in ads across the country. Like people in Pennsylvania, it was actually turning the needle basically for them to vote a certain way electorally, in this case for the Republican party when they would see this footage, basically of what was happening in Portland. So yeah, in terms of these protests, at least from, from the right side, let's jump forward to 2020, the protests that were happening a few months ago. I think this, it, it definitely was, was very B beneficial to- Are you talking BLM sorry. protests or are you talking right-wing protests? The, the BLM protests during the summer. I think it was incredibly beneficial before the election to, to the president, to the Republican Party in general. I mean, some of the footage that was coming out of there was absolutely insane. And for people being able to see that, I think that that did help to have an impact with a lot of those traditional suburban voters that President Trump may have actually turned off before. So from, yeah, from the GOP perspective, that was basically a gold mine of material that they were able to use. So I wonder what that says about, I don't know if it's our media or our culture, but like I was there too and there was certainly like some damage, right? Like, and it was, but it was directed at very specific places. And there was this narrative that like Portland was in decay and like it wasn't safe during the day and what, but you would go down there and in the day, people are just walking their dog, you know, their kids are playing in the park that was across the street. Like there was, you know, one of our previous guests, Kevin Frazier was talking about, you know, different realities, people living in different realities. But this is one of those examples where people who are consuming their media from right-wing sources and people who are com consuming their media from left-wing sources live in different realities. And I would even argue in this case, even the sort of mainstream media, the CNNs, even MSNBCs of the world were sensationalizing what was happening to a degree that it wasn't what we were experiencing on the ground. I don't know if you agree with that, Representative. Absolutely, yes. And I was going to make that note that mainstream media was falling more into the sense sense what you just said. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have this photo on my phone that just cracks me up. Um, as this was me like leaving the like, the the small block of where the protests were happening, I don't know, two in the morning or something, took a photo of just how peaceful the street was. And this was like, a three minute walk from that space. And it was and I, I titled it Portland under siege. Because um, <laughs> it was just I, I did receive some calls. I had some conversations with people who live in different parts of the state that were like, oh my goodness, like what's going on over there in Portland? Like, I'm sure it must, it can't, it's, it can't be safe to go anywhere. And I'm like, everybody, calm like, down. <laughs> everybody calm down. We're good. It's okay. We're, you know, Portland is not under siege. See though, I, I think though, Ben, 
what the combination was basically basically with that is you had uh, folks uh, folks on the left. I mean, particularly members members of the squad that were able to elevate some of these issues in terms of defund the police, abolish ICE, things like that. You had basically these sort of movements coming out, which were energizing a lot, a lot of people on the right who just don't agree with those sorts of policies. And then you had specific instances like this, right, of like property being damaged. You had these clashes at night. Uh, at least for me, most of the videos that I saw, things looked pretty peaceful, at least in Portland during the day. But I mean, things were just crazy at night. And this team of AP reporters did a really fascinating story, which I would encourage people to look up on, on Google who are listening. But it was like one reporter basically stayed the night in the courthouse with the police officers and saw sort of the chaos of what was happening in there. And then another team of reporters basically stayed outside of the courthouse with the protesters and was able to see what, what was happening there. So in that way, I think they're actually able to combine sort of two of those realities together and actually kind of give a, a good full picture of it, which I thought was a really interesting project to do. But I think sort of that tangent of people calling for those specific policies, plus people being able to sort of see like, you know, coffee shops are getting smashed and like, and like things like that, like that was what really helped to galvanize people. Well, so that, I guess that's an interesting thing to ask the representative. So you've got you've got abolish the police, you've got defund the police, you've got abolish ICE, you've got a series of policy reforms that I think putting aside the bad faith efforts to categorize them on the right, which um, like defund the police doesn't mean what the Republicans said it meant to the people who were proposing it, in my opinion. But where do you come down on that question of police reform, it, you know, is, would you say abolish the police or do you think it's defund the police or do you think it's police reform, police oversight? You know, how are you thinking about public safety in the time of, of 2020s? I firmly believe we need to defund the police. When you look at policing as an institution, it is something that was built from, it's, it's, it's a white supremacist institution. We know that uh, policing, the way we have it now comes from slave patrols. We know that communities of color are disproportionately impacted by policing. The other point of how these policies being brought up are something that has uh, motivated, that has energized a lot of the people on the left. We are in this coming session, at least here in Oregon, seeing some of those policies being pushed. We are seeing police reform. We are having this narrative of how do we make how do we change this as an institution? And so I think that's a really important piece of it is that, you know, the whatever, you know, one side or the other says about what happened over the summer, we are starting to see meaningful change. And that is, that's important. That's what folks are working for is, is seeing I hate to be repetitive, meaningful change. No. So, so, that uh, so I'm curious though, uh, Ben, if you let me jump in, uh, there was this really popular lefty meme on Twitter a couple months ago. You have to spend 120 days to become uh, a hairdresser and you have to spend 45 days in training to become a police officer or something like that. And it was sort of like, this is crazy. Like, why aren't we training their police? And a lot of people on the right, myself included said, yeah, you're right, that is crazy. We should fund the police more to create better training programs. So I I'm sort of curious is like, what? How do you think, because I, I mean, I think that a lot of people would argue basically that some of these police stations are actually basically underfunded, which causes them to have to cut things like training, which would make them better officers. So how, how exactly does defunding the police basically better hold them accountable? Well, I think what's really important, and, and thank you for that question. I, mean, I remember this meme. Um, <laughs> it, it was all over Ben's Twitter. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think what's important is that when we're looking at budgets, you know, how much of this money is going towards weapons that should not be the first line of defense when you're going to somebody who is experiencing a mental health crisis. It is, you know, reallocating things, but also making sure that we are investing in communities so that we aren't having to, like, so that, you know, and, and there's the argument of police take on, you know, more than perhaps what, what they're supposed to, because we're not investing in mental health services, because we aren't investing in our education, and we know that there is a school to prison pipeline. So, you know, there's, there's the piece of having to look at this holistically, and making sure that we are funding these necessary services so that we are needing less quote unquote, needing less policing, um, but also taking a look at those police budgets and saying, hey, like, 
let's re reallocate all of this money that is going towards all of this weaponry towards some of that training. So I, I, I want to jump in here because, um, first of all, I think that was an excellent answer. And it aligns with, I think, a, what I would even describe as probably mainstream progressivism. Like that's where most people on the left are at. So here's my question. As someone who spent January 6th watching our United States Capitol under siege by protesters or rioters or insurrectionists who in many cases were outgunning the police, they certainly were, were outnumbering the police. I am, and we, I just saw this article about the insane level of gun purchases that have happened over the last year, like basically breaking the record that was, that was started when Barack Obama was elected. Everyone thought Barack Obama was going to take your guns. So there's a big spike. Well, the gun sales over the last year have far exceeded that apparently. My fear is so agreeing with all of your critiques or many of your critiques, at least, particularly with institutional racism existing in, in public safety are you at all worried that if we defund the police or take away, particularly defund the weaponry of the police, that there will be increasingly circumstances where right-wing agitators are outgunning the people who are sworn to protect regular citizens? And I'm thinking particularly of the state capital where you'll be serving and where there was crazy protests happening um, over the last weekend or anticipated in the next few days too. So do you, do you have that fear or how do you think about you know, we're living in a weird place where guns are so easy to access for civilians that if we if we take away access for public safety officers, there could be a dynamic that is really dangerous for all of us. So I'm just curious how you think through that. So I think you're calling a little bit into question things around like, you know, our rights to bear arms and uh, the way in which we've, you know, and we've talked about this before, the way in which our founders didn't necessarily foresee the, the days that we're living in today. And we're talking about the Capitol and, and the defenses and security that we have there. And, and I can't speak to what things look like at the US Capitol. I don't think I've actually been in that building. I've been outside it. But I know that here in Oregon, for example, you can walk freely into the building without any sort of security check. And I have always questioned that. I have friends who work in other buildings across the country, and they're, they're just mind blown by that. So we need to have more security measures in place outside of policing. Right now in the Oregon Capitol building, you can walk in and you can be carrying, you can be carrying a weapon. That's not taken away from you when you walk in. You can open carry. Yeah, no metal detector, <clears throat> no sort of security checks, no screenings. You literally just walk through the door. Right. So, so we should be making more investments in that kind of security. There's a lot of conversations right now about the security around the, the Oregon Capitol building. And I can tell you that there are a number of BIPOC folks, um, whether that be staffers or legislators, that are not comfortable with this narrative of let's increase policing. Because we know, as what happened at the U.S. Capitol sh has shown us, um, and I mean here in Oregon too, we've got folks uh, who talk about Blue Lives Matter and um, are the ones letting folks into buildings. Um, but we know that there were folks who are on police forces uh, that, that uh, aided and abetted some of these things. When we're talking about security and protecting people um, and protecting buildings like the Capitol building, we can't just focus on, on policing, but we also need to be taking a strong look at uh, laws around, you know, the right to bear arms, uh, making sure that in Oregon we're passing things like mandatory safe storage, um, that we're taking, at loop, taking a look at loopholes across the country of folks who can pretty quickly, you know, acquire a weapon. And, and for, in many places, it is too easy to do that. Well said. Um, and it'll be fascinating to see. I think one, one sort of note for listeners is, is Representative Campos alluded to people inside the building. One of her colleagues in the legislature, you weren't in office yet, were you? No, I was not. Okay, so, but one of her, her future colleagues, well, now your colleague, literally a state representative from a rural part of the state walked to the exit where the, the Capitol was locked down because of COVID and there were these rioters on the outside trying to break in. A state representative was, there's a, video, there's a security camera tape of him literally opening the door to allow a flood of people 
to come in. And then you see state troopers rush to this corner to try to fend off these folks who are coming in to do God knows what in the Capitol. So can certainly understand a sense of fear that would be, because I mean, those people aren't people who agree with you, right? Those are people who are probably saying vile things about at the very least your policy positions, if not you personally. I mean, there's now a state senator who, you know, was speaking to those protesters and saying really harsh things about his colleagues. And I assume would include, he would include you. Right. Those insults. So um, yeah, it's quite the time to be starting service in the legislature. It is quite the time. (laughs) So speaking of the legislature, um, our last segment here in our final minutes, you ran on probably the most progressive platform or one of the most progressive platforms of any candidate in Oregon. You ran supporting the Green New Deal. You ran supporting single payer health care. You ran saying fully funding schools above and beyond the Student Success Act levels of funding, which would be a lot of money. You ran on um, housing essentially as a human right. I don't know if you ever said housing as a human right, but a massive expansion of affordable housing. Numerous house- times. <laughs> I figured, I figured that was true. So two questions. One, are any of those things feasible in a COVID-19 dominated legislative session where funding doesn't seem to be accessible for those priorities? Like, do you have hope for any of those priorities? And B, if not, what are your priorities in this session that's going to be a huge challenge? I firmly believe that these things are feasible. I do have hope. You know, what, what COVID has, COVID has had a lot of impact one of which has been to uh, basically bring to light so many of these issues that we've had for so long. And there are actually a number of legislators that are looking to essentially capitalize on that, right? To make sure that, that we're not returning just back to normal because for a lot of people, normal was not working. And so we know that as a result of, of the pandemic that we are going to see an, in, an increase in people losing their housing. One way or the other, we know, you know there, there will be investments that will be made, but it's going to happen. It is unfortunately the, the reality. The pandemic is also giving us a, a look at what, you know, what might come next with climate change. And we saw the wildfires in Oregon last year where our skies were covered, where they were filled with smoke, where it was dark, where, you know, if we don't address this sooner rather than later, the five-year-old or six-year-old child that I saw on my drive home from work one of those days staring up at the sky in bewilderment is not going to be staring at the skies in bewilderment. It's going to be something that that child gets used to. And so, you know, we need to make sure that in, in this COVID-centered legislative session that, that we're seeing, uh, that we are amplifying the issues that, that the pandemic has, has brought front and center. And so I'm pushing a couple of things around housing, one of which is in fully eliminating no-cause evictions. We as a state have just cause eviction laws. So this would be not just during the pandemic, but on a permanent basis. But on a permanent basis, yes. Other states justify having no cause evictions because uh, because they don't have these just cause eviction laws that we as a state do. So that's one that I'm pushing. Another is a Right to Rest Act, which essentially seeks to address some of the things that folks who are experiencing houselessness are criminalized for right now. Basic things that they need to do as a human being to live. And they've tried to get it through the legislature before, but what I'm telling folks is that my hope is that there's an urgency around housing, around addressing these issues, around putting funding um, to make sure that we are keeping folks housed, um, that we are address- that we are investing in youth homelessness. But uh, so that's one. Uh, another um, representative, Pam, is doing a lot of work around policies, around climate policies in particular, and I'm really excited to sign on as a sponsor to a lot of her legislation. I myself will be pushing for a higher minimum wage so that it is a living wage. And again, it is some, it's something, a conversation that's been had uh, throughout this pandemic, and we are now seeing it at a national level going into this next administration. And folks say, you know, that something like this is going to be difficult in a session like the one that we're seeing. The forecast, the revenue forecast does look better than we initially expected. But we know that too many people are struggling. They're being kept in poverty. They are without upward mobility, whether you are looking at people in the Portland suburbs in the Portland metro area or folks who are in rural Oregon who have felt they have been left behind because of the way in which the minimum wage is structured in Oregon. So on that specific question, 
Um, I bet you you can get it through the house with your colleagues in the house. But how? What is your strategy for getting it past Senate President Peter Courtney and Senator Betsy Johnson and you know the other chamber that's dominated by people who are certainly to the right of you and who will probably say something along the long lines of, "Well, we just passed minimum wage not that long ago. We're still phasing up to minimum wage levels. We need to let that happen first. You know, we got all these other things." Like how, how will you push it through? Or what is your plan for pushing it through a chamber that's probably going to hesitate to act on it? I think, you know, it's a matter of seizing the moment um, and putting that pressure on, on those legislators. Uh, it's also, you know, identifying who in, in the Senate is going to be pretty on or going to be on board relatively quickly. And we know that we've had a bit of a change in the Senate uh, that looks exciting. There, some work is happening. Uh, it's, it's slowly, slowly <laughs> um, <laughs> getting, getting more, more progressive, slowly I emphasize. But I think at the end of the day, it's making sure that we're putting pressure on people and that we are also empowering folks who you know, are directly impacted by these policies to raise their voices. And I, you know, I talked a lot on the campaign trail on this issue specifically about the minimum wage. I talked about how it was a pretty large impact on me running for the seat because I have conversations day to day in my workplace about people who work 40 plus hours at minimum wage and barely make it by are a $300 deficit every month are struggling to put a roof over their children's heads. So making sure that we're empowering those voices and elevating them because, you know, a lot of a lot of this is just having to look beyond the numbers, beyond, you know, this percentage of people is impacted or this percentage, you know, loses out here. It's it's making sure that people hear those stories. Hmm. So we're um, up campus. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a final question for you before I, I know we have to wrap up in just a couple of seconds here. So I'm curious if from your perspective, at least on the national level, we've seen per, like some pretty, I would say, lefty progressives actually work with folks on the conservative side on a number of issues. And um, a couple of examples of this are, we saw Senator Josh Hawley, who of course, very strong ally of President Trump, opposed the certification of the elections, seen as a front runner for the 2024 presidential election. We saw him work across the aisle with Senator Sanders for $2,000 checks. In the House, we've seen Rep. Matt Gates, who I'm sure you've probably seen on Fox and Friends a number of times, uh, actually work with Rep. Ocasio-Cortez on a number of issues as well. So if you had to look at your Republican colleagues in the House and then the Senate, who do you see yourself working with across the aisle on some of these ambitious uh, agenda items? And on have? what? Yeah, and on what? Like, what could and you- And on what, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I'm still getting to know my Republican colleagues, still matching uh, names to faces, which I will say is a little bit more difficult when like you're in the building and everybody is masked up, but you know, we gotta stay safe. But I, you know, I would say that one, uh, you know, I had a really great conversation uh, with, with a couple of folks that are on the coast, or I had some great conversations with folks who are on the coast. I myself grew up on the coast. I know what it is to grow up in rural Oregon, and that's where we're seeing a lot of the divide continuing to increase, right, is in rural versus... Urban rural divide, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and we're seeing the, the Republican-Democrat um, shift there. As previously mentioned, we lost a couple of seats on the coast, and so I think those are some of the folks that I'm hopeful to chat with, but I do know that there are people in, in the Republican Party who you know, recognize that things like housing are, are critical and that the state, wherever it is you look, it may look differently in whatever part of the state you're in, but folks recognize that we are facing a crisis. And that's a space that I know that we can cross party lines. And at the end of the day, we are elected to represent, represent the people, right? And so that means that we, there are times that we have to look beyond partisanship to make sure that we are representing our communities and, and fighting for what is best for them. Yeah, one of, one, of the th one of the theses that we'll continue to explore in this podcast, I think, is how economic populism presents this opportunity for the right and the left to converge a little bit. So for like for your proposals where you're talking about guaranteeing health care and uh, a higher minimum wage, housing, 
in in counties that have historically been timber dependent in the state, they have more poverty than in the district you represent. So those policies are going to help the constituents of Republicans disproportionately. So I think there is an opportunity there. Um, I guess we'll just have to have you back on the podcast after you pass some bills to tell us how you Yeah, did. you know, I, I'll just, you know, close on, on saying that there's space to work with one another when we're willing to listen to each other. And, and that means listening to our colleagues, and that means listening to our constituents. We see a lot of disenfranchisement because people do not feel that they are heard. And that's critically important to being able to be productive in, in these spaces. All right, Titus, final question. All right, uh, to close this out, well, Rep. Campos, thanks again so much for, for taking the time to, to join the Oregon Bridge. And just two final quick questions for you. Uh, first, for the folks who want to follow your work, want to follow you, want to see all the amazing things that you're going to accomplish in the legislature, uh, where do they go and do that? And then uh, the second question to put you on the spot a little bit, any potential runs we should see for you in terms of a leadership position or anything like that? So the for the, for the first question, um, that's a great question that I have yet to answer now that I have a, a different website <laughs> to be <laughs> followed at. You know, I have a Facebook page, which is Representative Wednesday Campos. First name is spelled W-L-N-S-V-E-Y. It is an L, not an I that, that exists in there. <laughs> Um, so you can find me on Facebook. I can also be found on the Oregon Legislature page. I have a web page under that. I don't remember what that web page is exactly, um, but you can follow me there, follow what's going on. And then in terms of a run for leadership, you know, I've been asked already um, by folks on, on what, you know, what is next for me running for things. And, and I'm just, I'm focused on, on the now. I wanna make sure that, you know, I serve my community well, because if I'm not, you know, and, and I, I intend to do the best that I can, but uh, if it turns out, you know, that I'm a terrible legislator, why would you vote for me again, right? And why would I be running for things? So I am looking at the now and hopeful, you know, to represent my community as best I can. Well, Representative, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thanks so much. <laughs>